let me now, while you're all here, turn this over to Nick Williams. Uh, Nick is going to bring you up to date on his progress in um, um, CRT rebuild. Thank you, Steve. Morning, everybody. Uh, just wanted to let everybody know what I've been doing in the background because I haven't really been very vocal about sending out emails or calling people on the phone or anything. Um, as he mentioned, I went to a place called Quest International. They placed an eBay ad for some re uh, rebuilding equipment. I have a full set of everything the museum has uh, installed in my garage at my house in Maryland. So that solves the logistical problem of me only being able to be here for one weekend out of the year to actually do glass work. So I can do it from home now. So the theory would be I can rebuild tubes at my house. Um, the next problem would be how to get them there. I don't particularly trust UPS. I've had tubes smashed by them before. Um, I think probably the best thing to do once the whole operation gets into motion is probably to pick them up from here or somewhere else and take them back in a trailer. That way I can work on them throughout the year and, and then bring them back. Uh, yes? I've had real good luck with using Greyhounds. Greyhounds will no longer take glass items unless they're installed in an enclosure. You can't put them in a box anymore. Then last time I talked to you, you were still assembling bits and pieces and making things work. Are you reached Yeah, my, I was, was working on the equipment because it had to be gone through once I got it back home. Um, you know, everything had to be greased, serviced, clearances checked, and that kind of thing. The lathes are in operation. They're working right now. The only piece that remains is getting an oven set up. Um, there's a couple possibilities there. I could build one out of, you know, similar to what the museum has here. Out of angle iron and insulation, I could have, uh, is your Yurkon still here, or did he leave? Okay. Well, John made a really nice one out of some kind of machinable ceramic brick, but it's quite pricey. Um, I have to remain cost effective about this because I'm not in it to make money. I want to just put that out there, you know, first and foremost. I'm here to help the community and do something that I, I like, just like Steve does. And to that end, I think probably building one like the museum has is probably the best option, something economical, something that works, something that gets the job done and doesn't really add too much to the, uh, the cost of producing a tube. Um, it's going to be electric. It's not going to be gas. I can't have gas lines running around my property for insurance reasons, and I don't have natural gas anyhow, so that would just create another logistical problem moving explosive things around. So it'll be an electric oven. I have pumping equipment. It's all ready to go. I just have to build it and put it into operation and, and test it. So, uh, have you found a source for necking glass and guns? Necking glass? No, I haven't made any calls yet. There are some possibilities. Uh, I think it was you that had sent me an email about the guy in Russia, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I got in contact with a guy who heads up a company named Melz, M-E-L-Z. It's about 60 miles north of Moscow. They do new production guns, and they also have getters and other piece parts for electron guns. So, we have a source for new stuff, and in fact, there's a package on its way back here. It's currently held up in customs. <clears throat> but it'll be here hopefully sometime in the next month. And then in that box is some new production black and white stuff for various different types, different focus voltages and things like that uh, that I can use in my initial testing runs as I build some tubes. I have some old duds you know, stored up in my loft at the house. You know, I'll build some tubes and bring them over, and we can install them into a set here at the museum and, and put them on display, just like we did with the one from Rax in France. You know, put it in a 630 or something like that. What kind of custom cost do you bring into when you step in? It doesn't really cost anything per se. It's just a, a lengthy process as it sits and gets processed. More so coming back here for some reason than it does going over there. When I sent him a box of old guns, just so you know, I sent him a, a roundy 21-inch gun, a 15G gun, and some various different types of black and white ones. I think there was five or six guns total in the box. I sent it out. It left New York, which is the end of the tracking on the U.S. side. It leaves New York inside of two weeks. And then from there, it took to the end of two months for him to actually pick it up in Russia. So the last status I had from the U.S. Postal Service was that it had left Russia, so it's probably held up again in New York on its way here. Do they have any experience with the vintage stuff? Or what does Rax historically have to do? Uh, it's about like the, what they had in racks, you know, they don't look like old guns, if, if I'm answering your question correctly. In other words, but they're electrically compatible. Does that, does that answer your question? That wasn't the question I asked, but that was a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a gun is a gun is a gun. As long as it plugs into the chassis, you're not going to care what it looks like through the glass, I'm assuming. I mean, the original idea, if I recall, was to machine out cathodes. I don't know if 
Ganlinter is here, but he left too. All right. Um, I know he did some experimentation with using EDM process, electrical discharge machining, to remove cathodes, and maybe John can speak more on that if he wants. But uh, we don't. I don't have an EDM machine. I'm trying to build a homebrew one, so I can at least have that possibility. If there is some kind of rare gun, like something pre-war, maybe that that we can't replace with something new production. You know, I, I'm aware of that possibility. So that's kind of on the back burner, though. The oven comes first. We have to be able to produce a tube in the first place before worrying about what guns go into them. So. Do you have an oven here? There's one here, yeah. So real, real quick, we had, I just, just to fill me in, because I guess I've been a little bit behind. There was talk of getting cathodes from Globetronics in India. Did that fall through? I got an email from them. Actually, John Ford would be one. They have a, a price sheet for heaters and cathodes and stuff like that, but we still have a pretty fair stock of that stuff here. So. Okay, so that's not an issue. John, you want the microphone? <laughs> yeah, there's there's companies still out there that still do make the piece parts for the guns, but Mel's has everything, and they can give me a gun on a stem already, just like we have in stock. Mel's in Russia. Yeah. And um, so you sent them some color guns. Did, was, mm -hmm. did they provide you any um, hint as to whether or not they could build something like that, or was it? So on the roundy color stuff, they had elements, individual elements of the guns in boxes, unbuilt, oh. brand new stuff. So from what I gather, and you know, once again, translating in Google from yeah. <laughs> Russian to English is somewhat tenuous. But from what I gather, they have glass beading, they have the guns, but they, they lost their, uh, the machine that heats the beading up to actually attach it to the guns. So he's, I asked him to investigate the possibility um, of getting that machine again so they could build those things up. Because then it would give us another source of new production, roundy uh, guns. I know Ingo still has a few, but. Uh, are they supplying just a naked gun or? It's mounted on a stem. Mounted on a stem? Yep. You can go on Facebook and join and like their page if you want. They, they're constantly putting up pictures of, you know, genetic diagrams of new buttons and stems and stuff like that. Mel's in Russia. M-E-L-Z, yeah. I'd try to pronounce the guy's name that runs it, but I'm afraid I'd butcher it. What city is it in? You're going to make me reach for my phone now. It's too bad we don't have the projector running anymore. Let me see if I can find him here. We'll see Mel's. So here's, if you want to look at it real quick, that's the, that's the place there. The guy's name is Vladim. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, though. It's kind of like Vladimir without the IR. Oh, they also have getters, too. So we're not, we're not in any danger of running out of getters or, uh, you know, the nickel lead-out wires that attach to the stem from the gun elements. Well, I sus I've never been to Russia, but I suspect that Russia has always been producing tubes. They were never not producing tubes, and a lot of that stuff crosses over between the audio and video crowd. So. I get pretty good life on my MC240 out of the Sovtex, so I'm not saying... Mr. Uh, Vladim is running a soft tech factory, but... <clears throat> the the um, uh, other thing I would uh, point out is that uh, my understanding is that the uh, Russian government and military are extremely conservative with keeping old designs in production, so there may be quite a market in the old Soviet bloc for this sort of stuff for other uses. <laughs> I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I don't know. Once I get doing this, maybe word gets out and somebody finds out that I'm doing this and offers me a contract or something, I hope not, but. <laughs> yeah. Trust in Russian government. Zaprudnya, yeah. 
No, it's about 60 kilometers or so. Remind me you have my phone. I can't rebuild that. Anything else?